everyone, and welcome to the webinar series on leading education in the age of disruption. Brought to you by the Development Academy of the Philippines in partnership with the Asian Productivity Organization. I am Yami D from the DAP Center for Governance, and I will be your moderator for this webinar series. The webinar series on leading education in the age of disruption aims to discuss the essential features of Education 4.0 and showcase current education governance trends, practices, and research findings that may contribute to the generation of insights and ideas that could be adopted for policy reform and program implementation for the education sector under the new normal. Before we formally start, allow me first to re reiterate some reminders and house rules during this webinar series. All sessions in this webinar are being recorded and broadcasted live via YouTube for documentation purposes. By joining this webinar, you automatically consent to such recordings. For attendance purposes of our participants, both here at Zoom and at our YouTube channel, kindly type in your name and agency at the chat box. Please put your microphone on mute to minimize background noises and avoid distraction for the duration of the session. Questions during the session will be relayed using the chat box. Kindly type in your complete name and agency in the chat box along with your question for the open forum. We may request you to speak if clarification or further elaboration is needed. Lastly, presentation materials can be accessed in the webinar series Google Drive using the link flashed in your screen. Our chat monitors will also post this link in the chat box. If you will experience difficulty in reading the presented material, you can download it now. Some emails, however, may require special permission on our part to access the files. Before we proceed with today's session, let me do a quick recap on what transpired during webinar one of this series. We were joined by Dr. Francesco Pastore, Associate Professor of Universita of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli, Italy. At the beginning of his presentation, he had explained to us the meaning of Industry 4.0 and its impact to the economy yes, and to the labor market. Time. For governments to address, Thank you. The effects of the Industry 4.0, he suggested the provision of both public material and non-material infrastructure, incentives for training, investments on new technologies and technology transfer, and reforms in the education system, as well as the formulation of new labor regulations. Meanwhile, education policies should be geared towards the shift of educational systems from sequential to dual educational systems that allow for a balance of theory and practice through programs that include work-related learning, apprenticeship, business incubators and training for entrepreneurship and self-employment, well-designed master programs and industrial PhD programs. Dr. Pastore emphasized that at the context of Industry 4.0, we should abandon the idea that theoretical knowledge is more important than practical or technical knowledge, that one is superior than the other. The duality principle should be much more spread. For today's session, we continue the discussion on education policies, this time under the pandemic triggered new normal. The session entitled Contextual Factors in the Design and Implementation of Impactful Education Policies under the New Normal will present a framework which helps with the systematic analysis of readiness for a new educational reform. After presenting the framework, our resource speaker will analyze the features of disruption induced changes and their implications for reform, design, and management. Our resource speaker is an associate professor and leader of the Education Policy Research Cluster at the Education University of Hong Kong. She had her bachelor's degree at Korea University, master's degree at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and doctorate at King's College, London. 
She's a fellow of the East-West Center in the US and of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. She is also the immediate past president of the Comparative Education Society of Hong Kong. Drawing on her various publications, she invented a framework to diagnose and evaluate the effectiveness of the plans, implementation, and outcome of educational reforms or policy, as well as teacher education and development programs. She directly advised over 1,600 people from 60 plus countries including policymakers and teacher educators. Her advisory is grounded in her hands-on experience of teaching and or teacher education in the four contexts of Korea, US, UK, and Hong Kong. To deliver webinar session two, let us welcome Dr. Taihi Choi. Dr. Choi, you may have the platform now. Thank you very much, Yami. <laughs> Hello everyone. It is really great to see you all and I saw you uh, chatting and then um, introducing yourselves and I think it is a great honor to meet you all and I uh, thank the APO to um, have for having invited me to share uh, my research and also some tips um, that I gathered as a teacher, teacher educator, policymaker. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will share my screen of the slides. And um, as Yami pointed out, if you have any questions when I am sharing, you can always chat, uh, write, uh, type up your questions uh, later with um, Yami will collate them and then ask questions at the end. So let me share this. Um, Screen. Then slideshow from the beginning. And switch. So can everybody see my um, slides? Chat, somebody is answering. Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Today, so I am going to share three different uh, sessions in three sessions. And then today I will start the first. Um, the topic of the day is more generic in the sense that um, I am not focusing on 4.1 um, innovation at this moment, but I am talking more about how any educational reforms initiations can be successful. So, and especially at the end, I will also add what are some of the features um, the context um, get to have under disruptions such as this COVID-19. So let's go. Before um, I share, I thought maybe um, this video will help us to think about what uh, reforms involve, especially the successful ones. Um, the video captures a researcher from the OECD, and she has reviewed um, about 400 reforms and then found some elements very inducive to success of reforms. So could you please um, pay your undivided attention to her? So let me I share this with you. Can you hear the video? Yes, mom. I can yes, hear you. Yeah. Yes, sure. It's Thank you. Yes, mom. The Education Policy Outlook looks at more than 450 reforms adopted across 34 OECD countries. From the study of these policies, we find some very common trends. We see that countries are investing in preparing their students for the future and that is investing in vocational education and training and investing in tertiary education. We also see that countries are investing in getting their teachers better prepared for teaching and learning. And we see that countries are investing in equity. That means that they're focusing on supporting disadvantaged students and disadvantaged schools. We also see that countries are not investing in evaluating the impact of their policies. And what we know from 
the study of different reforms implemented is that in order for successful reforms to happen, you need to invest in the classroom. That means that reforms need to focus on changing classroom practices. You need to invest in preparing teachers and school leaders. You need to invest in engaging stakeholders in the reform process. That means teacher unions and business and employers. And you need to invest in evaluating. And finally, you need to invest in making sure that reforms are sustainable and that they are not embedded in the political cycle. So hopefully um, this video kind of uh, set a ground for our discussion. Obviously, not every reform is a successful. And she is um, telling us that if any reform should be successful, the plans should be checked in terms of its actual involvement in individual schools. And also teachers and other stakeholders should be ready. And finally, when changes are happening, we need to check whether this new change is bringing in any implication for equity of education. So we can understand that education reform is not really easy. It's already complex. However, under this new situation induced by COVID-19 or any other disruptions such as um, regional conflicts or um, natural disaster, then we have a new situation which makes reforming education itself quite difficult. So, we, we already know how, because I could see that you are coming from um, education bureaus or uh, universities and um, different sectors. And I can see that you have already some experience of leading changes or providing education. However, in this COVID-19 situation, it has become really, really a different thing and um, has become further complexified. We already know that uh, schools are suffering, but this video, I think, will help us to see how it is experienced at home very vividly. So I would like to share this as a background as well. So let me share this with you. Public schools in Los Angeles closed this week, some 600,000 students forced to stay home. The same happened on the East Coast in New York City, where there's a five-week closure of the country's largest public school district, serving more than a million students, leaving officials scrambling to assure child care for emergency personnel and health care workers. Uh, you are, sir? Another major concern is making sure students don't go hungry. More than 70% live in poverty, so free breakfast and lunch is being offered at all New York public schools. Two meals I don't have to provide, which is two meals I can provide another day. City schools are also moving to online classes next week, but even the head of New York's public schools says some 300,000 kids don't have electronic devices or internet access at home. We ordered uh, hotspots. We've teamed with Apple. We've bought uh, laptops. Uh, we're going to have uh, laptops coming in at about 25,000 a day. In Miami, Mary Williams is racing to find child care for the rest of the week and beyond. Thank God I was off today and was able to come out here to get them something to eat, but for the rest of the week, I won't know. Every day, we're going to have a morning meeting. In New Jersey, remote teaching started Monday for several districts. We gave realistic fiction. Realistic fiction. Substitute teacher Trisha Angelillo has four kids ranging from preschool to seventh grade. How long are you prepared to keep this up? <laughs> the school says two weeks, I'm assuming a month. And I think the hope is this week we get into a rhythm. How overwhelmed are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, I think. And my kids can see it, I can feel it. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we can see that this pandemic is experienced very differently, and especially in terms of education. Um, we can see that the poor family, they even have to think about eating because some of the children, they would have hot meal from the school, but they can no longer when the school closes. So they are thinking about survivor itself. And then 
also, even though uh, Angelillo, the teacher, substitute teacher who um, showed up at the, toward the end of the video, she has good experience of education and she seems to be from middle class, but still she's struggling as well. With her four kids of different ages, she now becomes a teacher. So um, with this background, now we, we will think about, so how it is like to um, experience reform such as education 4.0 at the school level. But before I go on, I would like to um, get some understanding of what difficulties you have found more challenging in terms of leading this reform of education 4.0 if you are still at the um, stage of designing it, it is okay. Or if you have like already experimented, then you could share your experience. Um, the space I um, created, it allows you to express your ideas uh, in two to three words because I set it to allow individuals to have 20 characters each. You can go to the space either using this QR code or um, Yami has already, I think, put in this link um, in the, I think, I hope you can already see this. So, so this um, link to the space, you can type it up or, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, just a moment. mute can you hear us from the end point the video and audio are both working yes ma'am i can hear I yes. Can hear you. yes yes we can hear you ma'am okay, okay great because somebody uh wrote saying uh you can't hear uh, this is not a video this space is for you to write up um your um experiences so i will share what you will see if you um have gone to this space Yemi, can you please write uh, the link in the chat box or I can, um, if you, it would be very great. So, yes. so the people can just click the link. Uh, yes. And, yeah, thank you so much. So if you go to the space. Where's the link, ma'am? Uh, it is in your chat box. Yeah, we'll be putting it in the chat box. So can I you see. I think the link is in uh, up of the, uh, close to the QR. Yes. Yeah, you can type it up yourself or um, you can also click the link given in the chat box and, or you can also use the QR code. Let me check. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much, Leslie. <laughs> okay, so did you go to the space? Can you all um, access this space? So you will see this uh, blink and you can click here and then type up what challenges you have faced in reforming education. Any changes at the small scale level, like in a classroom or in an um, educational institute or at the government level. What kind of um, challenges have you faced when you are trying to lead some um, changes. Oh, I think we will um, have about like two minutes for you to think about what challenges you want to um, address like in this session, like discuss and or um, what kind of um, challenges you found more difficult to deal with in leading education. Um, please go to this Okay, let me go, yeah. Go to this website using QR code or this web address in the chat box. So Leslie shared the, li the link so you can click it and then type your ideas here.
Okay, so we can see that um, the problem in leading educational changes, the most important thing seems to be the materials. I can totally understand this view um, because I was a teacher and then when the government asked me to, because I was an English language teacher and then the government wanted us to teach in communicative way. And at the beginning, we didn't have proper textbook and we had to create the materials. It was so time consuming and I wasn't sure whether I was doing the right thing. Um, let me refresh it to see, okay. Internet connection, yes, right now. Um, Yemi did a good uh, review of the um, circumstances in the Philippines and then I could understand that about 40% uh, of students might have some difficulties in with devices or internet. Lack of resources, yes, we will deal with that as well. Online access, teaching online, <clears throat> resistant to changes, preparation of module, yes especially in the remote uh, areas, um, parents prefer to have modules, right? Um, budget, yes, if you are um, in charge of providing the budget, it will be really a problem and concern. Technology, readiness, um, logistics, monitoring teachers, poverty, yes. I think um, we can see that like, a lot of different things, we, um, the difficulties are commonly experienced, not just in the Philippines, the mo things that are mentioned here actually are discussed in many other uh, places. Um, it is really interesting that some of you are also uh, mentioning our culture and connectivity preparation. Okay, so um, we, we will, so some of these will be um, covered in the next session. So um, today I'm going to talk about the change processes. Um, next session, I'm going to talk about teacher change. So about resistance, etc. And final session, I'm going to talk about how we can deal with um, blended learning and then also um, other remaining um, aspects such as um, minority students, etc. So let's see. Okay, um, thank you very much for like uh, sharing your views very enthusiastically. It seems the um, creating the internet connection, giving the infrastructure is the most difficult metaphor now for this um, education 4.0. So thank you. Um, I think this is a good view of um, what we are thinking and what we are facing. So let's go to the next session. So um, as promised, I'm gonna talk about, so what factors affect reform um, success? Um, the lady from the OECD talked about it a little bit, um, but what I'm gonna present is a framework which will help us to diagnose and assess our reform uh, um, readiness in terms of the three different um, related areas. But before I do that, I will present a comparative case where I compare the reform process of Hong Kong and in South Korea in terms of medium of instruction reforms. Why Hong Kong and Korea and why MOI reforms, you might wonder. Um, it is because um, South Korea and Hong Kong, they share the um, similar culture in terms of, for instance, the um, meritocratic exam-oriented culture in the, as in the Philippines and then centralized education policy making. But also these two contexts are very different. For instance, in terms of the reform pace, Hong Kong is very long term and then like quite thinking through type of context. Whereas South, I think there is some kind of like a noise. <laughs> Whereas um, South Korea is more like um, on demand. So they even can change the national curriculum 
um, like twice a year. So um, Korea is really fast um, paced, whereas Hong Kong is very slow and they are very different in different matters. And I think this big spectrum will help um, you leaders to think about your own context, think um, reflecting on the cases of these two um, societies. I chose the medium of instruction reform because these days um, English or uh, languages are considered as resources. And then I understand that um, the Philippines have many, many minority languages. So I think you will fully understand its implication as well. And therefore I chose this as um, the case. Before I go on, I would like to briefly check whether um, what, because like many of you have written in the chat box and I want to see whether there are any, oh, okay. So you were um, sharing the problems in the, okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the next slide if it is okay. Um, before I compare, I think it is good to share um, what it is like in Hong Kong and South Korea, because otherwise it is like too far away kind of uh, story, so it won't have much relevance. So I'll briefly uh, discuss what the medium of instruction is like in these two um, contexts. In Hong Kong, the um, country is using two languages as the media, official medium of instruction. The first one is English, and the second one is Chinese. Um, before the handover of um, Hong Kong to China, English was the default medium. But then after the reunion, the Hong Kong government started a mother tongue policy, which means that the mother tongue of Chinese should be taught um, throughout the all levels from primary, secondary, and tertiary. The, so at the beginning, only one third of the schools were allowed to teach in English. And then the remaining two thirds were converted into Chinese medium. However, it created a lot of resistance and concerns and therefore um, there were changes, which will be discussed later. This is partly because as a um, pre-British colonial country um, or um, society, English is very important in students' life, um, especially in terms of mobility. That's why um, there was huge resistance. South Korea, in, in South Korea, English is not a daily language at all. However, it is a marker of social status. It also becomes the gatekeeper for entering to higher in, um, education or getting a good job. Therefore, English is very important. And the households, like about 40% um, of students, all school age students are getting private tutoring in English. So which shows that this is a serious matter for um, parents and students. And the government wanted to level the ground for um, schooling in terms of English education. So they started this uh, reform called TEE. -E. It means teaching English in English, even though English is not used in our daily life. And to reach this goal, they, what they asked um, have done is they changed so many different things, assessment, um, banning, but then also like uh, inviting um, native speaking English teachers, um, changing teacher education, bringing in certificate of um, in-service teachers. Even though the aim was very good, this also was not as successful as desired. And um, I will explain why. So before I, um, I explain these reasons why these two reforms suffered a little bit, staggered a little bit, 
I'm going to briefly talk about three factors that shape reform process and success. The first one is the features of the change policy or reform that is being introduced. How it is um, not just the objective features, but subjective features, how the reform is understood and perceived will change how it is implemented or even whether they are implemented and the impact thereof. Then who are involved in the actors and are they ready? This will also affect the success of the change you are intending to bring in, such as Education 4.0. Finally, the contextual features. Often, reforms are planned without serious analysis of the readiness or like we are doing, you are forced to bring in the change, even though you know the context is not ready. For instance, in the Philippines right now, until the vaccine is implemented, like all students are vaccinated, you can't do face-to-face. -face. So you have to do Education 4.0, whether you are ready or not. And therefore, these three aspects we will consider what detailed aspects will affect the reform that you are leading? Reform features can be not just um, specifically that reform itself, but other reforms can also affect the reform outcome. But I will start with reform specific features. As I um, introduced at the beginning, this teaching English in English, this certification. So what the government did was, the government wanted to change the medium of instruction for English language teaching. And they said, okay, teacher is the most important factor. We will identify which teacher is ready and then who is not. And if the teacher is not, if the teacher is like, okay, slightly ready, but need some more training, we will train them. If they are not ready at all, and then there is no possibility that the person can learn, then the person might want to change the track to other subjects. So there was this teacher certification scheme to identify the readiness of the teachers and help them to become more ready. However, the teachers had different ideas about this reform. They were not, so the government was only thinking about resistance or readiness, but actually the teachers were thinking different things. What was it? What was it? It was about the readiness, I mean, relevance of this reform, especially in senior high school. Um, I, I, I kind of suspect that it will be the same in the Philippines. If the teachers think that a new reform is irrelevant to students' college entrance exam, especially in senior high school, then they won't do it because after all, the students wouldn't pay attention. Parents will complain. And therefore, the teachers in South Korea said, okay, teaching English in English, it won't help students prepare for college entrance exam at all. So I'm not going to apply it. It is against the benefit of my student. And also, this certification was too difficult for teachers to apply to because the teachers were asked to take about 450 hours of development score before even they can apply to be certified at the beginning. And teachers thought it's simply not possible. So if the teachers think it is not relevant or is it not feasible, the reform will not work. How about the case of the um, Hong Kong? <clears throat> in, the, in Hong Kong, as I said, the mother tongue policy 
it was such so inequitable especially for the Chinese medium students because the majority of lessons in the government funded tertiary universities are all in taught, um, taught in English and then prestigious jobs are only recruiting English speaking students and therefore this reform which designated forcefully two thirds of schools and Chinese medium was simply not equitable. That's why teachers, parents, other stakeholders, they all resisted. How about relational? As I said, the policy that you are bringing in, the change you are bringing in, you should not just pay attention to this one only, but its relationship with other reforms, other changes happening. For instance, the EMI in Hong Kong, it didn't work because, um, as I said, two thirds of the Chinese schools were designated to be Chinese medium, right? Two thirds of um, public schools in Hong Kong were designated to be um, CMI instead of EMI. It, interacted with this bending system. Um, we have unofficial ranking of the schools and the schools are divided into three ranks. The EDB, which is the counter, um, um, which is similar to Ministry of Education or Department of Education in the Philippines. And they have this inner calculation of the bending that is also used for giving students the in-school um, assessment when it is converted to be used for college entrance. The student's um, score that is coming from lower bending that will be adjusted. And therefore, this all interacted and made the CMI schools ghetto in a sense. Um, all the elite, school, elite students would go for EMI and therefore CMI became the symbol of less prestige or um, students who are not performing very well. That created a bad image for the reform. So mother tongue policy was resisted. How about in Korea? Um, for Korea, as I said, because um, the TEE is, was started in 2001 and there have been many different other reforms that um, aimed to help this come true. And so even though some teachers found it irrelevant for students, they were ready in terms of materials like textbook, teacher training, and then also in-service teachers, and then also um, native speaking co-teachers. All these kind of helped it to be a bit easier if the teachers are persuaded to adopt this reform. So this was the um, good side of this TE reform. As you will see later, the reforms are very complex. It is not simple. It's not that Reform A is successful, reform B is unsuccessful, but rather different aspects are more successful, less successful, and in collaboration and collectively, the reforms impress people, affect people, and affect students. Before I go on, I think I can stop here and then I'll briefly have a um, Q&A because I don't want to like just cram in this views because it will be too much um, in a short time. So uh, let me go to the chat box and then see whether um, anybody is asking any questions. And could you please, um, up until now, um, can you maybe type in the chat box anything that you found um, not clear? or any aspect you wanted to know further or anything you thought was useful for you, even though we have just started our discussion. So could you please go to your chat box and then 
um, share your views. Any questions, first of all, up to now? Uh, Dr. Choi, I think we have a question from the YouTube channel from okay. Rip Ed from the Department of Education. Uh, the question is, um, this is from the Department of Education, Division of Bohol. Yes. And the question is, how to identify risk factors that might cause unsuccessful reforms? That's what we will discuss uh, through this session. As I said, um, we, uh, I will present the uh, framework, which will um, look at the reform in terms of three big aspects of reform, reform features, actors, contextual features, and later I will show a table where I list the most prominent risk factors, um, or which also can be turned into the success uh, factors if we address them. So maybe we can uh, get this, um, uh, return to this question later at the end of this presentation of the framework. Is it okay? Yeah, that is noted, thank you. Yes. Anyone else from the, so in the chat box, maybe um, you can type in the question. Or you can unmute yourself and then explain. Gaganda nyo dyan. Tinapay. Tinapay kayo. How is the... Or, um, I have a question from um, John... Uh, forgive me, <laughs> uh, uh, chat row number one. So, okay, the question is, how is the organizational structure contributory to reforms? Okay, um, because this aspect I will not uh, discuss in detail, uh, maybe I'll uh, address this a little bit here. The organizational structure, so if you are talking about, so it can be any for instance, it can be a division of the education um, bureau or um, department of education. It can be a university. Um, whichever it is, the leaders should understand um, what the person is aiming to do first, like very clear idea. And as I will explain later, this vision should not come from like you epiphany, like personal, it can be start, it can start from personal vision, but successful schools, uh, successful countries, they um, go through the opinion gathering first. And th that means the, there should be the channel of communication, not just once like, um, or like one direction. So um, from the government to the bottom or uh, from the bottom to the government, but rather it should be interactive and then sustainable. When the information is gathered, the information should be made accountable. Like there should be some way to close the loop in a sense. And um, any reform because they, when they are planned, it is planned against a certain context that the reform designers are familiar with. And therefore the reforms should be checked while they are being implemented to see what is happening as we will see later. Um, and then the second question, uh, Mefro uh, Posadas, can you share us best practices in, in your country on how to combat COVID cases in schools? This I will do in my third session. So I will talk about the success strategies to deal with um, COVID um, education under COVID uh, situation. 
I will talk about it in the third one in training session, three hour training session, um, which is interactive. And um, how can we evaluate or assess the efficiency or effectiveness of three overlapping factors shaping reform process? Is there a mechanism to do so? Um, there is no silver bullet to do this. Um, usually it takes um, both quantitative and qualitative data gathering because um, we don't we cannot necessarily understand um, through doing a, like a large survey, but to understand it, you also need to see how people are perceiving at the ground, the subjective um, understanding and the choices of um, the uh, decision making and then the difficulties, the background understanding. So um, the evaluation or assessment of the efficiency, it is, it should be done in uh, multiple, um, like rather comp like a both ways, not just like a quantity or quality, but in both ways. And uh, depending on the reforms, you need to um, understand the views from various actors I think um, the session later will um, answer part of this question. It is too complex to answer like in a short answer. Is reform really effective in addressing our problems nowadays in education, especially in the midst of a pandemic? Yes, of course, um, the pandemic creates a new situation. I think because I can see that the questions are actually um, asking the things that I will address later. Maybe I will um, come back to this after we have gone through um, the presentation, maybe that is better. I was all, uh, more expecting more immediate questions because these questions that are coming up are more to the uh, whole three sessions. So maybe I will present first and then um, come back to it uh, later. We will have about, I guess, um, 30 minutes or um, less um, of Q&A session. Okay, so the first one, reform features we thought about. Um, now we will turn to reform actors. I'm gonna talk about these um, actors in terms of identifying all relevant actors, raising their capacity and interrelational capacity, three aspects. So I will start with this identification of reform actors. Okay, let's go down. So it is often the case that when we are doing reform, for instance, um, the education 4.0, we might think, okay, the reform is only involving teachers, maybe principals or students, but actually it is not the case. Let's see this Korean case. Um, this TA reform, when it was designed, it was like the government thought that um, only, it is only the matter of the teachers. But actually, the officer who wrote circular to the schools, teacher educators, assessors, because it was a certification, principals, all these were involved and then creating confusion in the middle. So we need to identify who are the people who will involve in this chain of change and make all these involved people to have the same understanding about the reform. And like EMI in Hong Kong, for instance, in the tertiary education, recently higher education, they are increasing the um, EMI sessions from Ch uh, CMI. So it means um, previous Chinese medium modules are now turning to EMI. The problem is that the teachers, I mean, the um, uh, university thought if the teachers are ready, everything will be 
um, done. But, um, or the other way around, if the students are ready, teachers could do. But some students were not ready and some instructors were not ready for EMI sessions. So we need to really um, check out the different spectrum of readiness, even of the same group of people. And also, as I said, the chain of action, you have to think about and then identify all relevant people. Even the government officials, like um, maybe secretary or those people who are doing admin, they also have to have clear understanding. In Korean case of the TEE, the officers who wrote the circular thought, because the name was, the certification name was teaching English in English. They thought it is a matter of English proficiency, but actually it was about pedagogy. That aspect was not communicated clearly. And they misunderstood that no English should be allowed, but actually the policy allowed the flexible use of English. But because the circular was written in a way that created confusion, teachers thought it was make, doesn't make any sense. So there was resistance. So we also really have to check the chain of events and identify all people involved. Otherwise, it will create resistance, difficulties, confusion, delay in reform. Once we have identified, we need to make these individuals ready. We might just think about readiness in terms of knowledge and skills, but actually, it involves more. Some people are not even aware that the changes are happening. So you have to really make everybody concerned understand. You might think education reform is just a matter of the school, but it is not. We need to be able to persuade parents for any meaningful changes to occur. For instance, when this um, TEE, teaching English in English reform was initiated. Parents resisted, they complained. They said the children are not being ready for the college entrance exam. So the awareness raising should also be done with parents as well. And it is not a matter of knowledge and skills. As I said, in South Korea, the teachers, especially young teachers, they were trained to teach in communicative way early on. However, they were not persuaded to adopt this reform because they thought it won't help their children, I mean the students. So they had negative attitude toward this reform. That's why the reform didn't work out. So we, we shouldn't just think that it is a matter of cognition readiness, but it is effective readiness and it is also awareness raising of all related stakeholders, including parents. And we already explained about this uh, individual readiness in um, Hong Kong, right? So we also we need to think about students' readiness as well. Next. We might think, okay, if individuals are ready, we have already finished the preparation, which is far from the truth. We also think about, need to think about interpersonal readiness. What do we mean by that? Okay, so if teacher educators are ready and teachers are ready, but the teachers do not know that there are training programs, the, it is such a waste the teacher educator creating wonderful programs, but not being signed up. So there should be clear communicative and then collaborative system built in to make any reform successful. And this includes a, when necessary forming a um, working party so that 
all different people. They don't have to waste talking to different people overlapping, but rather they sit at one space and make necessary decisions at one go, rather than say two, three parties gather together and then talk about the problem and come with the solutions and other two, three parties resisted and then objected because these two, three parties, original team members didn't, didn't see, foresee the problems. Um, for instance, I recently um, advised the Cambodia um, one university to in the change process of um, medium of instruction. And then also the um, curriculum development of um, uh, foreign languages. What happened is that because um, there were so many stakeholders, like donors such as a uh, World Bank, teacher educator, teacher educating institutes, um, schools, and then teachers, um, and then also the businesses which will hire the graduate from this university. Everybody had different opinions. The government did a fantastic what communication skills. <laughs> the, uh, the Cambodian government did a fantastic job of creating this system where everybody is convened to share their views. This is very rare. It doesn't happen in many countries. So this is a very good system. It is almost ideal. However, because of the hierarchical culture, the teachers, uh, mid leaders, they didn't express any ideas, objections, even though they knew that some of the suggestions that came from the business sector, the donors such as World Bank or um, Korea or Chinese donors or whoever, they, they knew the suggestions wouldn't work, but they were afraid that if they expressed their ideas, then they will be in trouble. So it is great that if we could create a communicative system, but that system should ensure that everybody from even lower rank can express their ideas in a safe environment, not worrying about the repercussions, getting penalized for objecting to the ideas suggested by the high ranking leaders, for instance, right? And um, I think it was a good idea that the Hong Kong government conducted the surveys regularly, not just the one off at the beginning of the reform, but every year collected ideas, responses, difficulties, and adjusted the reform, for instance, school based assessment which will feed into college entrance exam. And therefore, the reform was refined as it goes along, it went along, which is a very good system. As I said, the context changes, the meaning, feasibility, perceptions, everything after it hits the ground. So it is, you should put in the regular feedback system two way, not one way. So that is one way to create this interpersonal readiness, not intrapersonal readiness only. Now we will go to the third aspect of reforming, contextual features. For these contextual features, I will also talk about reform specific feature, features, but also relational features as well. So analysis of context in terms of a particular reform, we can think about the resources such as facilities, funds, time allowed, systematic, systematic readiness such as when we are bringing change, we also always have to think about whether it is aligned with the high state exams, such as college entrance exam or teacher readiness. 
we also need to think about this untangible aspect of history. For instance, in both the Philippines and then in Hong Kong or in Korea, English means prestige. So if we start a reform that kind of try to minimize the role of English in public education, it will be resisted because people will think they are now um, losing their opportunity for gaining social mobility. So this kind of untangible culture aspect, the um, public perception or sentiment is also important. I guess that's why um, one of you mentioned um, when I first asked you uh, what are the challenges you are facing, you mentioned culture as well, right? So in South Korea, like the TE reform, um, the textbook was designed to help, like the resources were given. So at least teachers agreed in principle the benefit and feasibility, even though whether they actually did it or not was another matter. Um, in EMI in Hong Kong, despite all challenges like, you know, student readiness, teacher readiness, materials, problems, resources, whatever, the whole stakeholders were ready to adopt fine tuning policy, which means um, now, because the mother tongue policy was resisted so much, the government allowed individual schools um, to teach some subjects in Chinese or English, regardless of their designation, as long as they prove that the schools or the teachers or the students are ready for the change. So even though you are an EMI school, for instance, if you want to teach Chinese in Chinese, because after all Chinese, you know, like it is appreciation of the language itself, then they could now turn to Chinese medium for Chinese subject only. For other um, schools, even though they are Chinese medium schools, if they prove that the teachers are ready and students are ready, they now can teach some subjects such as math or science to be taught in English so that they can fight the stigmatization of being a Chinese school and then being the lower bottom rung school so that they could recruit more students and then create a positive image in the local community. So Sometimes that kind of things can, if you can persuade these stakeholders, no matter what changes you're facing, you can still go with your reform. Reform culture. Um, so a reform well-planned and educationally motivated. If the perception is in general like this, then teachers will respond to you more positively when you introduce new changes. But if you have built a fame or <laughs> infamous like defame, then that the changes are politically motivated. That is to raise your visibility as a leader or because the government has changed the hand or the minister has newly been appointed and we are starting a new reform, then teachers will not respond. Because if you are creating this context where changes are continuously introduced, the teachers or schools do not have the resources to be to mobilize and they are fatigued they are tired of changes, so they don't respond anymore. This was um, afraid um, was the case in Korea. Like every time new government started or new minister started, then there was a new reform. So now the uh, current government is thinking of a um, educational committee, which is which transcend the individual governments and 
therefore the change of the government will not incur any new changes like just because of that and in emi case in hong kong um because the reforms are usually planned um, with this five to seven years of preparation everybody knows the changes everybody hears about it gets trained so they have less difficulties i think as long as there is a consensus so i talked about so many different things so i think it is time for us to have a brief um, summary midterm summary so as i said um the education reform success the implementation the outcome they are affected mostly by three big aspects the features of reforms themselves actors involved and their individual readiness and interpersonal readiness and analysis of the context and then um checking the readiness and making the ground firm before you start and if it is not yet ready you can start from the preparation then starting the reform right away one good way i think um, it is happening already in the philippines as well is starting small you start with um, experimental schools particular regions then get feedback advise revise and implement the improved version to another region then expand it um, after revision feedback this scaling up rather than implementing a reform right away whole scale entire country will help will help and then also um, when a new change is being uh, introduced not introducing it for the sake of change but really thinking about the changes from diverse aspects will be um, very helpful and as i said the reform features not just the objective features but the perceptions of the stakeholders right such as relevance of the reform for the students complexity feasibility and self-containability which means whether it is interacting with other policies as i introduced for the hong kong case of interaction the emi or cmi reform um interacting with school bending system that kind of things and also any reform needs time for adjustment the maturity of reform it is obtained only after certain time passes right so we also have to think about this as well um identify all people relevant not just teachers um like typically think as you know such like leaders but officers in the education offices teacher trainers examiners circular writers etc etc right attitude affective aspect is really important some things are allowed only legal systems are changed for instance recently south korea had to change the law because the after school um, activities for primary school for english language education it was considered illegal um, especially if it concerns teaching ahead of the curriculum so the government changed the law itself so this kind of like systematic um, check of the readiness is important i think hopefully um this kind of uh, provides a view of um what things should be checked before you think about introducing a new reform and um <clears throat> after this we will think about what additional considerations should be uh, made under the new normal but before we go to that um, I wonder if there is any question considering the content covered up to now, because some of the things, as I said, will be covered um, in the letter section of today and also will be covered in uh, next to two sessions. 
The next session is about teacher education and change. And then the final session is about how to deal with COVID-19 induced school closure. What are some of the success strategies, etc.? cetera? So um, maybe we can confine the question to the content covered up to now. So any questions up to now? Um, before um, I, I think there's uh, one, Dr. Choi, from yeah. one of the uh, state universities, Sambonga State College of Marine Sciences and Technology. Yes. Um, their question, uh, um, her question is, uh, how can we evaluate or assess the efficiency or effectivity of the three overlapping factors? Is there a way, uh, is there a mechanism to do so? Yeah, so um, as I said, there is no silver bullet, like uh, um, one answer, like, uh, what should I say, like very simple answer. Usually this kind of um, um, evaluation, uh, it takes about um, like, um, so to give the case of the Cambodia, what I did was I was talking with different stakeholders, conducted a survey, also did a case study to understand how the impact was like a, to what degree the um, education reform was um, implemented, why it is implemented to that degree and why it is not in some aspect, but not other aspects. So it takes um, like rather some time to the proper um, investigation. Like, and also, um, as I think this person who asked the question quite well understand that these three aspects are not actually um, like discrete. They are not exclusive to each other, but they are all interrelated. But it, the answer to the question can be made only when um, an assessor of the reform impact sees the feature of the particular reform because even though I presented all different aspects of these reforms, um, the reforms are quite different. So you don't even have to sometimes um, look at all these uh, aspects at all. Um, I will cover this in the second session, but um, for instance, um, like to look at the um, education. So in South Korea, we had a reform very similar to education 4.1 some time ago. And we, uh, what the government wanted to do was um, change all education accessible 24 hours everywhere, you know? And so what we did was we created the mobile learning system. And this reform, it was very differently experienced across teachers, for instance. Junior teachers who, who just freshly graduated from university, they live in ICT world. They are screen generation, if you know what I mean. They are continuously using computer, um, mobile, different apps. So they are living in this um, virtual world already. So for them, this reform was just simply um, being fam being getting familiarized with particular apps to teach, such as, for instance, vocabulary app or um, um, science, because like, for instance, for science, there was this like a program, virtual laboratory program. So for them, it was just getting used to this and then living in their own um, arena. However, this same reform was experienced really differently for those teachers who didn't have um, ICT training as part of teacher education, who are not familiar with using uh, mobile apps and then also like uh, mobile integrated or um, ICT integrated pedagogy. Because as you perhaps understand, you being able to use different technology is a quite different manner, I mean, different matter from 
you being able to use the technology to assist student learning, especially young learners, or if the students are um, not tech savvy, for instance, like recent, recently I taught a module, um, which was um, like two students who are coming from a different context, not Hong Kong, from somewhere um, ICT is not used at all in their teaching. So when I did blended learning, the students felt it was not useful. They thought I was wasting their time. It was so um, irrelevant to them. But then I had to um, invite a person who is working with their government to create this education 4.0 reform for their context. So it was going to become relevant in six months for them. So as I, I what I'm trying to explain is that um, this, um, this heuristics is a um, guideline for checkup of the readiness, but each reform is very unique and it can be experienced very differently. The same reform can be differently experienced in, um, for instance, like in your uh, reason and then in another reason, in schools in the remote area on top of hills and in schools which are um, located in the urban city center. And therefore, um, I can't really say, okay, there is this checklist, you can just do the exam effectiveness right away uh, at one go, because it, it really depends on the reform itself. <laughs> I, I, I hope I answered the question. All right, so perhaps uh, one more from the, one of our YouTube uh, participants um, from DepEd, from the Department of Education also. What a specific and effective strategy can be used to reform actor, for reform actors to unite and act in unison towards a proposed education reform? That I will cover in the second session which is about changing teachers, changing actors, customized to reforms. So could I invite uh, the uh, person who asked the question to participate in my next session? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So um, shall we have one more question, uh, Dr. Shaw, before you proceed? Yeah, sure, sure. So maybe um, we have here from one of our uh, participants here at the Zoom channel. So we have, how did these reform shapers work in your in country's reform for medium of instruction, as may have been shown by some success indicators? Yes, so um, that's why, um, so I was uh, advising this, um, um, education, so English language education division. Now it is integrated to other subjects, for, but there was this division previously. And then um, I was asked to give a brief um, assessment of the TE reform in its um, third year. And so I shared the um, outcome and I said, um, the reform, like for instance, the reform was perceived very negatively. And um, so it was like the most, um, like one significant factor was attitude. And that was created from the um, channel of communication, lack of channel um, of communication. And then some people who, for instance, these officials in the um, educational offices, they were not included. And then also teacher assessors who are recruited from schools, uh, universities, 
and training centers. Three, three assessors were assessing one teacher at one time. And unfortunately, some uh, university teachers really didn't understand the context very well. And also the teacher assessors from the centers, which were um, outsourced. And these teachers from assessor centers, they didn't know what this reform was about. And they were assessing teachers in terms of 100% uses of um, this English language in teaching English. So this kind of um, like insufficient, so like failing to identify all relevant people and then um, giving proper training was the cause of the confusion. So the initial training of the assessors of like one hour on the day of assessing was extended to one full day of um, training to um, increase the understanding and awareness. And the um, part, uh, policy circular was also revised and recent, emphasizing that this is not English only, this is not about English proficiency only, but it is about pedagogy and it allows for flexibility. Then also um, the whole system was later changed. So the, um, because the uh, government, I mean, the teachers were thinking that the TE scheme was not relevant so that's why the government later started a new English, um, English um, exam for college entrance to replace the current um, grammar and test oriented exam, but to test the speaking skills and writing skills as well. Even though later, unfortunately, um, after the government changes, the whole scheme was abolished. But anyway, so like some of these are the aspects that were um, helpful in um, assessing the reform. Hopefully it answered the question of the participant. Yes, that was from Mr. Mariana de Guzman. So thank you, uh, Dr. Choi. Um, uh, Yami, we only have like uh, 40 minutes, but do you think it is Good to have like say a three minute or five minute uh, leg, leg stretching break for the participants or do you think it is good to just go? What do you think? Uh, that's okay ma'am, you can have like two minutes perhaps. Okay, so um, because I can see that some people are like moving, like uh, leaving the chair. <laughs> I, I think it is totally understandable but maybe they need some like a break for, um, yeah. <laughs> You know, okay, first sure. of all, yes. So um, right now it is um, 24 after of uh, three. So how about we have a uh, two minute break? So uh, 26 or maybe 27 um, seven because I think it is almost past. So 27 after 13, um, two and a half minute-ish. We will resume the session, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, see you very soon.
Okay, um, is everyone back? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, that's great. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, ma'am, we are back. Great. So are you ready to go for another 30 minutes? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. So you got, you got to go. Okay. So so let's um okay, let me switch the display. Okay, so any additional considerations under the new normal? I think uh, it kind of connects with uh, the question one of the participants asked previously, right? So like um, trying to do, you know, reform, is it really like relevant? Is it ever possible under this new normal? I guess it is true that we will be seriously limited, but it doesn't mean that there is no opportunity at all. So. Um, I think it's like it's everything starts with understanding what we are dealing with. So let's see what additional features we have to deal with under this new normal. So lessons from the pandemic. So we are not just focusing on the COVID-19 situation, but any disruptions, um, large scale disruptions we are talking about. Anything more? <clears throat> Policy features in the age of disruption, like COVID nineteen, I think they um, it. We are thinking about we're dealing with unexpectedness, urgency, large scale changes, sudden need for creating resources, and blended learning. Right. So what I mean by this, I will explain. I think somebody, okay. <clears throat> For instance, why unexpectedness? Because everybody, we, we really didn't expect to have COVID-19 at all. And then um, we didn't expect that it would have this kind of like huge impact at all. And school closure, urgency. So now, even though the school is um, like very in a very new situation, we still should continue. Uh, Yami, can, you, um, can you mute everybody, please, Yami? So um, the and then also um, so for instance, that's why like for the remote area for this online learning. Um, uh, some of the schools, like, I mean, the education offices, you are printing day and night the modules for this, you know, like those who do not have any access to the internet, right? And, um, oopsie daisy. And also, like, we, we are talking about uh, creating resources, not in terms of just financial resources, but sudden human resources, because now we need people who can deal with uh, blended or like a remote uh, learning and then um, social resources because this created a huge like attention and an emotional um, distress for some students and then and some uh, vulnerable students do not have any more um, support. For instance, in Hong Kong, the language minority students or uh, immigrants or those students who are coming from low SS, uh, lower social economic background, low income family, they uh, used to have support from NGOs and local centers, volunteers, but the COVID-19 closed down these centers and they now are left with just to do things like by themselves, even though there are some in, uh, local initiatives. So this kind of changes, we also have to think about when we are um, doing reform. So now the situation is very different. And then also the government has to, like it may have to um, reduce the budget, for instance, like uh, allocated for this um, uh, education for, for zero, um, when they really think that, you know, there are other more important matters such as like, you know, saving the life of people, right? So we are talking about this kind of situation. <clears throat>
but the COVID-19 and any like this pandemic <clears throat> is very specific in the sense that it opened a new partnership. As you can, uh, like I, I um, got the reports about the Philippines um, and also other countries as well. It is not just now schools and states and Ministry of Education or Education Offices doing education. Other um, like the um, computer companies or mobile network providers, NGOs, all these other parties who were considered as outsiders are now contributing to ensure ensuring that um, quality education is provided for everyone. So for instance, like um, me as a researcher, I am asked to provide help, um, you know, like to provide this like quality education. Um, and then also once the changes are like decided, the training is going on online, even under this uh, pandemic, the media is doing its job. For instance, in the remote area in the Philippines, the radio and the TV, it, um, they are playing, playing a very important role in continuing education to the people who do not have um, ICT like devices or a network. All these people are joining hands and this is creating a new possibility for us. So how could we um, ensure that the contribution is um, like working for the best for everybody? For instance, when everybody is trying to chip in uh, their two pens, if there is no coordination, the efforts might be replicated and duplicated, right? And also the communication should be ensured, like teachers, for instance, should learn to speak with different uh, stakeholders who didn't really, they, you know, they didn't have to deal with, for instance, like, you know, there's more, um, there is even need of like teaching parents, right? And also um, under this new normal, um, as I said, that like we, so now I am going through these new features um, using the same framework, right? Can you see that I was doing this? So policy features under the new normal and then policy actors under the new normal pandemic. So I start with identification. So we now have new actors, but then it means we now need to create channel of communication and collaboration, which were not there before. We need to think about individual readiness, right? And for teachers, it is ICT integration, working with different parties, but then few people have this kind of experience. And we also need to think about part-time teachers. You know, full-time teachers, they have access of devices from the uh, schools, but part-time teachers, they do not necessarily have the devices to do online teaching. So for instance, my university um, um, used the reserve of money to purchase devices for part-time instructors because they don't necessarily have computer at home or Wi-Fi. And then also like, you know, even though they know how to use um, internet and do email, they may not know use like uh, the interspace where all the um, teaching materials can be collated and then accessible to every student. All, and then also they, the teachers should be able to um, adapt to contingencies and then persevere despite the difficulties. So we're now talking about a totally new set of skills for the teachers under this pandemic. Now, contextual features under the pandemic, what are changed? There is increased gap between haves and have nots in school equity matters, because now, especially, the parents' role is becoming huge. And if the parents are too busy to deal with, as you saw from the video, then the students are left to survive and struggle or just simply give up. So we have to think about this huge gap being created. The vulnerable groups, especially language minorities, 
all the information, the support that are being given, they are simply not accessible because they don't know what is being said. So how can we mobilize the network of people to help those who cannot understand the information that, that are being given? That is also another matter to think about. And then, so this, like for instance, the equity matters, this is the data that is um, shown about, this is about the um, uh, Australian context, but then you can see that the COVID-19 has created the increasing gap between the regular group and then under previous group in terms of remote learning. The learning gap is... May webinar ko po yan, may seminar? Oo. So, buong gampisan ako? When you are using the mobile, can you mute yourself? Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, these gaps are becoming bigger and then um, high, like a low income family and high income family, the, the difficulties experienced are very big, like a huge gap. So there is an intersection, interaction between the uh, house back, individual house background, and then the learning difficulties and then uh, learning outcome. So we have to be really sensitive about this equity implication under COVID-19. Um, I, I do not have the muting function. <laughs> okay, anyways, so next. Um, we are talking about education, but actually the um, tension is also outside of education sector. You know, economic setback for schools as well. Some of the kindergartens, they have to close down because um, the parents, you know, they don't believe in kindergarten online learning. So they simply didn't pay the money. So some uh, kindergartens had to close down. Um, for instance, the private schools, the, um, the parents who cannot afford the extra fee, they are pulling students out of the schools. Parent productivity, now also like, you know, as you could see the part-time teacher in the video, she has to deal with her own children's education as well as their, um, her own job. As I said, the welfare system is rather failing. Psychological distress of students are becoming higher, especially for young learners. So, The checklist now have to be revised, reflecting these changes under COVID-19 or any social disruptions at large scale as this. I think um, any organizations now, um, like even though we all have this like emergency readiness in terms of finance, now we have to think about emergency readiness in terms of people's resilience, people's readiness, system readiness. We also need to, because like the policy, even though we are now dealing with um, education 4.0, in doing other reforms as well, because these major disasters bring in school closure, we need to think about the compatibility with remote learning in any reforms that we are planning from now on. And for identification of actors, now the education is provided in conjunction with other sectors beyond education sector. So how can we collaborate with them? Individual readiness, it includes resilience and creativity because sometimes we have to just do things without means. And interpersonal readiness, cross institutional governance and accountability system, because now we are talking about working with um, the sector beyond education. So as a Ministry of Education or um, Education Bureau, um, what, 
what who are the parties that are involved in education provision and how will you collaborate and how will you ensure that there is some somebody who is in charge rather than the responsibility just being slipped through between the two institutes and then also um as i said this kind of disasters create equity uh, situation, like uh, inequity aggravates the inequity. So equity sensitivity should be um, built into the system. And finally, the society-wide tension beyond education should also be considered in doing education reform. So what are some of the lessons? To sum up, um, we can check the readiness or do the risk assessment in terms of the three aspects of reform assessment in terms of um, reform features, policy actors, and contextual features. And the reforms should make sense to the individual actors at the grassroots level. It is not just the objective senses and objective features, but subjective features affect actors' engagement. All related reforms should send out the same messages. And we also should see whether there is any interaction, like the school bending and CMI and EMI designation in Hong Kong. Check out the equity implications, not just for the intended reform area. Sometimes things happen outside of the intended area. For instance, in the US, the US government um, didn't want anybody to fall behind. So what the government did was they said if the school is not improving everybody's um, um, learning. So they were checking learning gain. If the learning is not good enough, it will affect individual teachers' assessment and their salary. It will affect the school, even they can be closed if the school is not performing well. You know what happened? Some schools, because it, it is a matter of a survival and the um, teachers and then other workers for the school. If the um, school manager thought that certain students would drag down the and then deflate the um, mark of the students, these students were asked not to take the exam and they were suspend, suspended from the schools because um, they didn't want the schools, the whole school to close. Therefore, we have to check the equity implications in other areas then, not just the intended area. We need to identify all policy sectors, <clears throat> including such as the people who are writing circulars. Do not check on just the individual readiness, but collaboration and communication system, especially vertical communication. Think about power and ensure that the people who are at the bottom rung can express ideas fully <clears throat> without worrying about their uh, being penalized or being marginalized. We, under the pandemic, we need to learn to work with new actors, such as mobile network providers, etc. And then the contextual features, we need to ensure the context supports the reform, and then in various aspects, legal aspects, um, the society's culture, expectation, public sentiment, etc. Be aware of reform fatigue. Do not issue reforms, um, multiple reforms at one time, or do not issue reforms too frequently. For instance, um, in Hong Kong, 
when the reforms were um, issued, like uh, eight different reforms at the same time, there was a bottleneck syndrome. So schools only could respond to selectively one, one or two reforms at a time because there were so many reforms, didn't have any resources to engage with everyone. And building continuous evaluation and revision of the reform because the reform changes the context. The reform that you bring in becomes part of the context and changes what is possible and what is impossible. And investigate how marginal groups are affected and whether new groups of marginalization or new vulnerable groups emerge. To deal with disruptions, systematically analyze the need created by a disruption using perhaps the framework that I uh, suggested and then um, pay attention to the long-term needs of those impacted by crisis because some effects may persist. Um, the WT, um, WHO who says that this impact will last at least like three to five years. So we should see what is going on, not just at this stage uh, at one point, but later as well, um, continuously evaluate. And also view crisis, not just as like, you know, limitation and difficulties, but as opportunity to rethink about the education understand and utilize the newly built extended network of policy actors, for instance, for this pandemic, and think about whether the status quo is the most desirable or whether we could do things differently, like we're doing this webinar <laughs> for this APO. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, you could um, read some more, uh, like, because all these are drawing on my research. So you could go to this website and download my papers or materials for free. And then you can also write to this email. If you um, want, for instance, like you, uh, one of the participants wanted to see how you could determine the efficiency of a reform. If you um, give more detail about the reform that you are intending to do, um, maybe we could do a proper um, assessment of the impact later together. And the references are provided in these uh, slides. And as you know, um, I uh, shared the slide before this session with Yami and she uploaded this to the um, Google Space that um, it's uh, so you can always go back to this and then I understand that she's also recording this session so probably you will have access to it later if you wanted to go back. We have about 10 minutes because um, we had the um, Q&A in between. So there are 99 questions so I don't think I mean new questions and it seems there are how many, 200? So I guess, um, Yami, did you have a time like to look through the questions and see whether there are any questions I can address right away? <laughs> and thank you so much for um, uh, giving full attention. I could see that um, 300 people, um, like you said, one person you persevered through this long presentation. <laughs> so I really appreciate your undivided attention and then also um, sharing your questions and then um, make me think about these um, different aspects of the reform further. All right, thank oh. you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Choi. So uh, maybe just a few questions before we close. Yes. So um, I'll just have to read uh, one of these uh, comments or question from a participant from the Department of Education in Naga City. This is from Ms. Mary Ann Papika. Uh, she said, the mission of education systems is the same. It is to overcome the learning crisis we are already facing and respond to the pandemic. We are all enduring. The challenge today is to reduce as much as possible the negative impact of this pandemic 
we have on learning and schooling and build on this experience to get back on a path of faster improvement in learning. As education systems cope with this crisis, how do we ensure that we can recover and come out even stronger with a renewed sense of responsibility while assuring that all children have the same chances for quality education? So uh, would Education 4.0 be an answer to this? Um, I, okay, so it seems there are two, like a, there are two parts in this question. One is, one is how can we overcome this pandemic, like this kind of difficulties? And the other is, will Education 4.0 be a tool to do that? I think um, for the second question, yes, I think it is partly, yes. If the, I mean, after all, um, for those, especially for those students who already have this um, network, um, this enables the students to continue um, the education with least disruption. And therefore, um, this, um, and then also like we are now exploring the upper limit of this IT, ICT education. Like, you know, we are now exploring how AI, um, artificial intelligence can contribute even. And, and therefore like a, a previous session and then also an upcoming session by uh, Professor Ming Ming Chu, um, they are all um, talking about its potential. So yes, I think it, will contribute. However, um, the change itself, just simply turning the, um, the whole system to um, AI as um, concluded by um, my, our, our previous presenter is that it is not the um, silver bullet. It is not the answer. I mean, like the only answer. It should be accompanied with the traditional matters as well. For instance, um, I mean, the Philippines government is doing a fantastic job. Um, I was quite impressed by the fact that the um, education uh, office now is like printing materials for the parent to teach. And uh, this is quite aligned with other um, countries. For instance, now German, Germany is doing parental education because um, they can see that the role of parent is becoming huge. So um, we can, and then sometimes like, you know, um, you also are a bit learners, I can see, and you are professional learners in a sense, because you are in the education sector, right? But still, you can see the limitation of this, um, you know, online space. Um, therefore, uh, while it is a great, um, like, change, and it, it allows new things that we didn't do before. For instance, right now, the conferences that I've been attending, um, before, it allowed only attendance of, like, certain people. But now we are using, like, YouTube streaming, which makes, like, so many different people can attend at the same time at a low cost. So I think this is creating new opportunity. But we cannot um, like forego some other aspects. Um, this connects with the answer, my answer response to the first part of the question. Um, how can we overcome this difficulty? I think it only uh, starts with the basics of uh, human humanity, of caring, <laughs> um, thinking about others. Um, so, it is really great to see that in the Philippines and then in Hong Kong and elsewhere, people are joining hands, volunteering to help. And I think it is really great. But um, at the same time, as the people who are leading, um, you know, the participants here are all leaders, I can see. So um, as a leader, how can you um, scale up and how can you coordinate all these different efforts so that you could, we can maximize the benefit from the resource and connect uh, people of the same mind and um, help each other to overcome 
this difficulty, that will be the first step. Um, I will um, cover how we can how we can prepare teachers to be equity sensitive um, next in the next session, and then also in the final session, I will um, also share some strategies that um, other governments have used to help the um, vulnerable group of students and families um, or schools. So. I think this kind of um, efforts will help us to overcome um, like um, any other disasters were overcome before, even though it is true, this will limit us in many ways. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Choi. So um, it's really uh, very unfortunate that we cannot accommodate any more questions because of the time. It seems like the topic has been very interesting because it's very relevant and we have a number of questions that we may perhaps um, uh, email to you, uh, Dr. Choi, for answers to our participants. So for now, um, before we end, uh, may we request everybody here at the Zoom uh, platform to open their video uh, just for documentation uh, purposes. So we will have a picture with a resource person. <laughs> That would be fantastic. Um. <laughs> so we will also, uh, we recognize our participants watching this webinar via YouTube. So while we are unable to accommodate you at this time, uh, due to the limited uh, capacity of the Zoom account, we look forward to have you with us in our succeeding uh, webinar. So again, may I request everybody at the Zoom platform to open their videos so oh, we yes. can have a picture. All right, so may I ask Ivan to take a picture? Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you uh, in person, <laughs> in a sense, face to face. Hello, Dr. Hello. Choi. Yeah, hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Here. Thank you so much. Hello, Sir Ton. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All smiles. Hello. Thank you. Dr. Choi. Thank you, Dr. Thank Choi. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Choi. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Thank, Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. Choi. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi, for sharing. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, at the end of this session, we would like to remind our participants to accomplish the feedback form through the link that will be flashed on the screen and uh, typed at the chat box. So our chat box monitors will be uh, posting the link now to the feedback form. See you all on Thursday, September 10, 2020, also at 2 p.m. for webinar session three on modeling online conversations by Professor Ming Ming Chu also from the Education University of Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Hey, by the way, the way ma'am. Ma webinar session. To your respective email addresses at least a day before the event. Again, may we remind you to please accomplish the feedback form after you leave the platform. Your feedback will be valuable in improving the delivery of this series. And we will be using this as well to validate your attendance. It was a pleasure hey, to see you this afternoon. We look forward to meeting you all again, again this Thursday. God bless us all. Thank you. God bless. God bless. God bless everyone. Bye bye. 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 Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for the congratulations. Bye. 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 Bye.
God bless. Bye. 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 Bye bye, I will leave.
Thank you so much. Salamat po. Salamat po sa lahat. Goodbye. Thank you po, Dap. Maraming salamat po, Dap. Dapper po ako. Thank you po. Thank you po. It's the Ovigan po. Thank you. Bye-bye. Leaving the feet. Thank you, Yami. Thank you very much. How we wish we can go back to Dap at Tagaytay. Can you take it and I'm going to go to the beginning? Can
Mamiya, me. Thank you. Welcome, Paul. See you, Paul.